Okay, so we need to actually build working products. You know, the, the great thing about software is that it's not just, it's not like just a cartoon, that even though cartoons have this kind of dynamic movement from panel to panel, they are ultimately static. It's published there. Software works. It's a machine. It has to work. So there's coding, testing, and QA. This deserves its own slideshow, but it's not going to get it here. But as you know, it deserves its own three or four quarter sequence, which many of you are in the middle of or have taken. Okay, so user testing, so he's just going to skip all that stuff. Right? That's the technical stuff. User testing, in other words, you can have all your great ideas, but actually try it out on some users and double check your assumptions. Now here's an interesting mixed metaphor. If done well, helps nail low-hanging fruit. What does the metaphor low-hanging fruit mean? It means it's the easy thing to reach, right? The apple at the top of the tree. Anyone here ever picked apples in October? Well, you should do it. Fine. And there are apples at the top of the tree, up 25 feet, and there are apples that are like 6 feet, and the apples at 6 feet taste just as good. And they're low-hanging, so those are the ones you go for first. And what does it mean to nail something? It means different things, right? What, has anyone ever nailed a low-hanging fruit? This is a mixed metaphor. I think that would be hard to do. So I don't know. So there's something called Silverback. Google Analytics, um, this is something you should know about, and probably some of you do, is that as you go to a website, you are tracked. Maybe not you individually, but maybe you individually, of course. Um, but maybe just the fact that, um, let me just give you another example, I think. Yeah, A-B testing. So A-B testing means you make two different versions of your website, one in which the button is blue and one in which the button is red, or something like that. And you, people randomly get one version or the, or the other version, and then they keep track of how many people click on the button which says purchase product or something like that. And maybe they find that the blue works better than the red. So they do that for a few days. They're getting this data back in real time. They say, oh, blue works better. And all of a sudden, everyone's getting the blue button. And the companies make a lot of money. So A-B testing means you have two versions of something. And you try them both out, maybe randomly, or maybe one state gets A and one state gets B, or something like that. The big websites are doing this all the time. Amazon, Facebook, all the time they're doing it. And you may or may not be aware of it, because you may not get the the, the new version of something, or you may not notice. But they're very carefully observing these and doing analytics means then find, getting the results. Do people go f tend to get to where they want to go faster, or do they buy more, or whatever, with these different UX uh, things. So Google makes it easy to do that and provides a lot of, uh, of the software structure. So we won't worry about that too much, but. Um, you should be aware of it. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the development cycle, very different from the waterfall model in some ways, but very similar to the waterfall model in other ways. Though they don't want this to be, uh, oh, rinse and repeat. <laughs> so it's waterfall, but it's not, um, you just go through once, right? So you can go back a lot. It has a life cycle. You can go back, oops, you can go back to, from one place to a previous place. So there, there is a, so what he's saying here is that there is this sort of a linear sequence, but he's not making any claim that when you get to some place, you never have to go back. But still, there is, you sort of have to do the, the inside things, needs and specs. Now remember, think of the Apple metaphor, or sort of inside the, the outer things, like uh, uh, visual design. OK, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Oh. So that's sort of an interesting thing. UX design, what's usable, useful, and desirable. Product management, the business side of things, what's needed and therefore valuable. And engineering, what's possible and what's not. So people whose majors at least indicate that you have these different interests are all in this class. And uh, there's an overlap. And even if, you know, we're talk we've talked about things in this class that you realize, oh, OK, I don't want to do that. I never want to write another requirements document in my life. Um, 
It's good to know that people do it, right? And it's good to know what they're doing. Oh, it's not linear. It's a cycle. Better products, happier users. OK. So that's um, uh, kind of, that enabled me to wrap up the entire order without having to write my own slides. Uh, so that's a, that's a plus. But Since I do like writing my own slides, I've had a few more. I couldn't let the last, the last slides I show you be somebody else's. So um, it seems to me that the core, and this is to me, who started off as a programmer and, and has a degree in computer science, that the, in some ways the core of what's going on here is things like programming, algorithms, data structures, debugging, ICS 21, 31, 22, whatever courses you've taken on that or are going to take in the future, focus on these things. Um, and that's, it's not, that's not all of computer science, but that's certainly the, the, the core of both computer science and engineering. But what software engineering adds to this is two more dimensions. I, I sort of think of this as a sort of one sort of nugget or one central idea. But it adds two things. One is people, okay? And of course, I'm thinking about multi-person, multi-version notion. So, uh, if you just think about, uh, if, if you're doing all this stuff, programming, algorithms, data structure, debugging with one person, then that's fine. But that's only a small subset of what actually gets done in the real world. In the real world, there are many people involved, and they have different roles, skills, and interests. So maybe their role is UX engineer, or their role is um, customer or user, or their interests are maybe it's another programmer or another person working with you, but someone who has somewhat different interests or skills. So a large part of software engineering is acknowledging this and sort of saying, okay, we want to, this is the reality, we have people involved, that makes it a lot more complex, but perhaps more interesting, depending on your interests, and so we want to take that into account. So that's one dimension, is, is multiple people, and then the other dimension is time. So time always, always exists, of course, but in, um, if you're just thinking about programming something, you generally are thinking, okay, I need to get this program and written, and then it's sort of this, it's sort of like I've just mined and made a diamond. But the diamond is now forever, right? It's not going to change. It's sort of this static little thing. But software engineering says, no, nothing is static. Things change. We have versions. We have maintenance. We have um, changing needs over time. Um, so. We need to plan for that. We need to design for change. We need to modularize in a way that makes maintenance easy. We need to sort of be aware of that from the very beginning. And that has repercussions throughout the entire process and everything we do. So together, all those three things, this, this core sort of programming stuff, but then also, of course, you know, things like, I mean, now look, looking at this slide, I feel bad that <laughs> I didn't include UX design somewhere. Uh, but there's a whole panoply of other things get, that get involved, and those all make up software engineering. So I think I'll leave on that note. Let me just remind you. I don't have any more clickers. Let's just leave on this note. Um, different, different office hours this week, and then don't forget the final exam next week. Okay, see you there. This room.